Jesus, give us the vision to see you when you come into our lives. Help us to be patient with your elusive presence. Preserve us from trying to figure you out on our terms. Help us to be hospitable and receive you on your terms. And when at last you speak to us, help us to respond to your voice to answer when you call our name. And then to follow you where you lead. In your holy name we pray. Amen. For the season of Lent, we have been looking at portraits of Jesus. To learn more about who Jesus is, and in learning more about Jesus, to learn more about who we are, and who we're called to be as followers of Christ. Our text this morning is a famous one, John 3, and in it we've read the, maybe the most famous verse of all of Scripture, the 16th verse. But our portrait from this morning is maybe unfamiliar. Jesus as the serpent in the wilderness. How many of you think of Jesus as a serpent? It's an odd image, right? An odd portrait. The reason, it doesn't feel right to us, does it? We hear serpent and we think evil right away. I think that comes from the, the story of Genesis 3. And the temptation of Adam and Eve, and um, we hear serpent, and we think tempter, we think the devil, and the serpent is cursed of God, and why connect Jesus with the serpent in the wilderness? What is John doing here? So maybe we need to go back to the story that John references. So here we go. Moses is leading the people of Israel across the wilderness after the exodus out of Egypt. And they start to complain. And I mean bitterly complain. Here are your words. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. They are complaining about the manna that they have. And, and they're pining for their captivity in Egypt. I mean, think, think about this word. There's no food and there's no water, and we detest this food. Right? So there's obviously food, right? They don't like it. They're complaining. In some ways, uh, the people of Israel, while they're going through this experience with Moses, they're just like everybody else. They're just like regular people. How often do we find freedom or release? In other words, do we find new patterns to be so difficult in our life that we, that we decide to fall back into old patterns or old traps? How many of you have started something new in your life? Started a new pattern or a new thing in your life and found along the way that it was either too difficult to continue or it was too unfamiliar, and so then you fall back into the old path. It's exactly what we see Israel doing here. <laughs> Typical human behavior, new patterns, freedom, new life, are, is, they're often the most difficult things to live into and make permanent in our lives. And because of that, we then slip back into those old patterns even if they're, if they're life-destroying for us. Even if they're not good for us, we find ourselves slipping back into these old patterns. And God tires of this and gets irritated with this. So the text tells us that God sent poisonous snakes to the people of Israel and the snakes the snakes bit the people and they died. And so they were suffering with this and the people turned to Moses, acknowledged their faithlessness, and they asked for help from God. And God tells Moses, it's interesting, this is what he says, he says, make a poisonous serpent 
serpent. In other words, make an image of these poisonous serpents. And set it on a pole in front of everyone. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Now, I have all kinds of issues and questions with this particular uh, idea for healing. For this idea that God presents, not the least of which is like an image set before the people to look at. It strikes me as fascinating, given so much of what the Old Testament says about images, but I'm not going to go into that. Right? What I want to look at is just this idea that a serpent is lifted up on a pole, and in looking at it, the people receive healing. So what I think I see here is that this story offers us a portrait of Jesus who is lifted up and God says, look at him and you will be healed. Now this story, interestingly enough, reminds me of another image of healing and service. Now I don't know if you're in uh, familiar with a particular image that has to do with the healing arts. Um, it, it's an image of a double serpent twined around a pole. It's, it's called a caduceus, I believe. Right? And, and interestingly, this symbol is sometimes overlaid on a red cross. Right? Here's an example of one. Right? Now, I find this image fascinating. It's, it's a sign of healing. It's a sign for those who are practicing the healing arts. And, and what this image points to is that healing will take place with all those who take this image on. Which is really fascinating because it's also an image of a serpent lifted up. So, as you think about that for a minute, you're thinking about, okay, Jesus as a serpent, Jesus as a sign of healing, this image of one lifted up, and when we look at him, we receive healing. Now I want you to apply all of that for a minute to John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but receive. What, what does it mean if we interpret that text, that verse, through the idea of healing? What might it mean if that verse has nothing to do with substitutionary atonement or forgiveness or any of the other things that we often put on that verse, but it has everything to do with healing? To believe in Jesus is to look upon him being lifted up. And eternal life then is receiving healing from this one who's lifted up. What might it mean to say that when Jesus is lifted up, he brings healing to the world? And the cross, while it's about forgiveness, true, and it's about victory, absolutely, but it's also about healing. That sort of strikes me as something that's worth looking at. If you look at Jesus on the cross, what do you see? What is it that you envision when you see Jesus on the cross? love and trust. Love for the world that brings Jesus to the cross. Trust in God that this lifting up will bring redemption. I see one who takes the curse of violence and sin and oppression and hatred without returning Enters into the hardest places of life 
where suffering is, where hurting lies, and doesn't return that suffering, but takes it in, lives with it, acknowledges it. And interestingly for me, I see freedom. It's fascinating to say that, I think, because you might say to yourself, how is it that Jesus is free? He's nailed to the cross. But I see freedom for in Jesus' love and trust, he goes there willingly. And he goes there not to fulfill anyone else's expectations or desires for who he was supposed to be. But he goes there free to be who he knows he's supposed to be. When you look at the one on the cross and you see this truth about Jesus, you live. You, you know what real life looks like. What human life is supposed to look like. Filled with love and trust. Presence in the hardest places that acknowledges suffering and pain without returning it. And freedom. So the question I might ask you is, where are you broken? Where are you hurting or poisoned in your heart or mind or life? Where are you dying? Little deaths or even in the big death? Where are you suffering the most in your life? And if your answer is to me, well, Pastor Ronnie, I appreciate you asking. That's very nice of you. But I'm good. Thank you very much. The two realities are going on with you, at least one of them. You've either whitewashed the difficulties of your life by not dealing with where you're really hurting, or you've never really taken them seriously, and you just gloss it over. And imagine that if you just stick it over in the corner and kind of ignore it, it'll just sort of go away. Well, you know what? It doesn't. It seeps into every part of your life in ways that you can't control. Suddenly you're angry and you don't know why. You haven't dealt with the poison. Suddenly you lash out at someone who's done nothing and you're not even sure why. But you haven't dealt with where you're broken. Or you might say, ah, oh, that person, left. they're just a freeloader. They need to get up and get a job. And you're judgmental and harsh and cruel. And you don't even know why because you know you're called to better than Perfect. 
Do you find that to be true? No, me neither. Healing at the cross, what Jesus does at the cross, is not about curing all of the ills in our lives, but it's about healing. So what's the difference? A lovely Christian writer, Rachel Hell Evans, writes this about what the church does with the sacrament of the anointing of oil. She writes, we may not be able to cure what ails our friends and neighbors, but as Christians, we are called to the work of healing, of entering into one another's pain, anointing it as holy, and sticking around no matter the outcome. And anointing is an acknowledgement. How many of us just so deeply need and feel that inner sense of being acknowledged? How often when you share what's going on with a friend in your life where you're hurting and suffering, how often do you just want them to listen? And acknowledge that this is true and real and in present as you share it. This is my problem as a man. Jen shares these things with me all the time, and a lot of times I think, oh, she's looking for a cure. I've got to fix this. I'm obsessed too much with cures. Let me fix the issue.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, help us to acknowledge where we need you the most in our lives. Help us to see that your presence is always with us and you bring healing of a sort that we need for eternal life. Holy God, give us the faith to be people who follow in your footsteps, who bring healing through presence and acknowledgement, who stick with our friends and our neighbors and each other through thick and thin, no matter what. Help us to be agents of healing in our places of work, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, that we might be ambassadors of Christ who bring true healing in the world. In your holy name, we pray.